afternoon everyone welcome to the new old day to den in a new location so instead of a messy kitchen behind me it's now lots of messy boxes instead but you'll never know hope you've had a good week um it has been a bit of a hectic crazy one for me um, but i am safely settled in my new place i can't wait to give you the grand tour once everything is decorated um, and we're going to talk about something really, um, really interesting and close to me um, today, which is around mental health and coaching and um, thoughts. Um, we'll talk about the word limiting beliefs because that's a bit of a cheesy word now, but around those kinds of things. Um, I have been working with Vicky for about 18 months now, and she has literally transformed the way that I've been thinking. So I cannot wait to bring her on and introduce you because she has literally... Um, I say she's changed my life. She said it's all me, but she's definitely pointed me in the right direction, that's for sure. So without further ado, I'm going to bring her on now. Good afternoon, Vicky. Hey, Susan. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? So yeah. um, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you got into this, what your background is, and, um, and then we'll get started chatting. Oh, okay. So in 2001, I became very randomly, a uh, hate hunter. Um, and obviously as a hate hunter, you're not just recruiting people, you've got, you've got to support people, you've got to develop the people before they go for their interview, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I loved that job for yeah. years until I really, really, really didn't. Yeah. So I had that moment of you know existential dread. What do I do now? Because I've been doing this for, I think at that point it was about, 17 years. Wow. So what changed time. for you? What, after all that time, what changed? Um, well, I was working for myself, by myself, so that been quite challenging because headhunting, you know, you're selling yourself into the client, then you're selling yeah. the client to the candidate, you're selling the candidate back to the client, and there's negotiations, and it's... Um, and and the, the atmosphere around recruitment changed massively. Yeah. So we went from people making quick, good decisions to interview processes getting dragged out to 12 interviews, at which point you would lose a candidate. Yeah. And it was just, it was a lot of game playing and I just got bored of it. Yeah, got fair enough. Bored of it. So yeah, as I say, sense of existential dread. So, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because I don't like this. Um, and so I sat and I picked myself to bits which was one of the things that I used to always advise clients to do, yeah. uh, sorry, candidates to do, and thought about what I actually did. Because we all tend to think of ourselves in terms of a headline. Yeah. You know, I am Vicky Connor and I'm a headhunter. Yeah, but what does that mean I actually do? Yeah. And picked it apart. I mean, what do I do on a daily basis or a weekly basis or even a monthly basis? And I came up with coaching which I'd thought about probably two or three years previously. And that was it. Then I was galvanized, went off, did my training, loved it, um, and still love it. Absolutely love it. Oh, you're so good at it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I guess, I mean, that's probably a really good question to start with, actually, because before I met you, I was like, I thought all coaches were kind of you know a air, bit airy fairy and a bit like and what do you think yeah um and then and then you just slapped reality back into me and I loved that um so when people are looking for coaches yeah you know obviously everyone needs something different but I guess there are some out there that are not necessarily that qualified so what should people look out for when they're um, researching coaches and things like that Oh, you should definitely ask your coach what their qualifications are. Um, so the school that I went through um, were at the time the only school in the whole of the UK that was accredited by someone. Um, so there's two governing bodies for coaches. It's voluntary. There's no set. There's a there's a set of guidelines. There's a code yeah. of behaviour. Um, so there's the ICF, which is the International Coaching Federation and the AC, which is the Association for Coaching. So who I did my training with was accredited by both. I mean, 
I don't have I didn't have to do any training. I could just turn around and say, Hi, I'm Vicky Connor, excellent coach. Yeah. But I think you should. Lots of people can coach, lots of people do coach. But what I found with my training was while I had an idea of what it was, it opened up a whole new world of models and thinking for me, which yeah. was great because I can then pass that on to my clients. So what kind of, apart from the qualification thing, what other kind of questions should you be asking a coach? Or what should kind of, kind of questions should a coach be asking you? That's probably more important. Uh, well, I think it's a mixture of both. Um, I mean, I, I like my potential clients to really kind of grill me because yeah. it's an important relationship and it has to be right. You know, you have to know that you're going to be supported and collaborated with, but what you don't want is someone who's going to collude with you. Yeah. Because that will can, that will perpetuate the behaviours that currently exist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you're you right. don't let me get away with anything. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that thing of, you know, you might have a coach that will agree with you that, yeah, actually, you know, your boss shouldn't have done that, and, yeah, you were hard done by, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not pulling that person out of that fug. That's actually helping to bury them deeper into yeah. it. Um, so, I mean, I do ask people what they want. Um you know, what they expect to go, what their expectations are. Because um, apart from anything else, I need to check that those are realistic. Yeah. You know, with the best one well, in the world. said, I wanted to be an astronaut. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it has to be realistic. Um, otherwise, everyone's going to just get frustrated over it. And but should everybody have coaching? Or do you have to be ready for it, or does you, have, happen to, you have to be? You have to be ready for it because if you're not ready for it, then you're not going to respond to it in the correct way. You're not going to assimilate your own reflections and learnings. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often, what happens is people come to me and then disappear for a few months and then come back because they wait until they feel that they are one hundred percent broken. Right. Nobody's broken. Yeah. Nobody is broken. What people get is a bit lost or yeah. their self-confidence takes a massive dip. Um, or they just can't play and see the wood for the trees. I think, yeah, we've all been there, especially a lot of people in the last 12 months. So, Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. In terms of um, what you see with your clients or people, potential clients, are, are there common traits problems that people have um yeah there's quite a few of those um just smiling away there yeah and they actually one of the questions i'm always asked is is it different coaching a, a man to a woman and actually well, that's a good question actually it's generally not yeah the people seem to presume that there's a gender divide about what people worry about in their lives and actually it's not as different as people think yeah you know, a man is just as good at trying to pretend he's a mind reader as a female. Oh, let's talk about the mind reading. <laughs> I know you love that. I love when you talk about the mind oh, reading because yeah. I'm so guilty of this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I call it mind reading, but really it's just your own sort of internal narrative and your own interpretation yeah. of what other people are thinking. And regularly it's fed by a bit of your psyche, basically your inner critic. So the more you mind read, the more you tend to beat yourself up. But so, the thing is, people do seem to genuinely, right, you know this example, it's one of the best examples ever of mind reading. Yeah. And um, I was coaching someone who was uh, looking for a promotion to uh, chief executive officer. And it was our second session. And she went on to lay out a three or four minute conversation between two people who she felt were opposing her appointment. But I got full sentences. So it was on he shit said, and then she said, and I went back and forward and back and forward. It was absolutely fascinating to watch. So anyway, she finished their conversation 
And so I asked her if she'd been in the room. And she looked at me like I was bonkers. And I went, right, okay. So who do you know that was in the room that overheard this conversation? And again, she just looked at me like I was absolutely bonkers. Yeah. So I asked the obvious question of, well, how do you know that this conversation happened? To which I go, I just did. So at that point, I turned around and said, look, let's just forget being a chief executive officer. I said, we could sell out stadiums with that level of psychic ability. (laughs) Yeah. But all that was happening in that inner narrative that she had was she was feeding her own self-critic. Pretty specific. And she was driving down her own self-confidence. Yeah. So I've got a really good question here. Do you find women are less confident in themselves or does that? I don't actually. That, that's Genuinely good. Don't. Yeah, I think sometimes we play up the differences more than they actually exist. Yeah. No, most definitely. Um, no, I probably have coached roughly 50 50, male and female, and the self confidence issue. Um, whilst men might appear to be more outwardly confident, um, that's not necessarily the internal case. And men actually beat themselves up about it more than females do. Right. So quite um, often, co- coaching a man around confidence issues is actually more difficult than coaching a female. Yeah. Because he wants to be the alpha male. Yeah. You know, and it was, he, he feels that that's the expectation that's put upon him. Yeah. Whereas a female can be seen to be softer where, you know, he's going to be standing there doing his best Peter Pan with his hands on his hips. Here's a good one for you. What's the difference between coaching and mentoring? There is a difference. My particular practice is quite mixed up in that, to be honest. Uh, Coaching is regularly very much directed by the client, their outcomes and their reflections, whereas mentoring is where you would interject with some advice yeah. Um, or direction that someone should take. So I, I take a mixed approach. Yeah, um, I, I find that really helpful. Um, but you shouldn't be in a position where you find <clears throat> find a coach telling you what to do, should you? No. no. You, see, that's why you... I can't be a coach, because I yeah. would be like, <laughs> you need to do this. Why? What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the mentoring part of a, a coaching relationship, is that's about exploring possibilities. That's about um, exploring what will work for the individual. Because to dictate to somebody and then not either being entirely happy about that or just not being their style or whatever, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Just not going to work. And what else um, kind of comes up regularly in discussions with your clients? What themes are we all are we all struggling with that we we all pretend that we're the only one in the world that that suffers from? Oh yeah, well I think we all know this one as well. It's you know the language that you use around yourself. That's been a huge one for me. Yeah, constantly like tweaking my language now. Yeah. Because how you describe yourself to yourself and or others actually impacts quite heavily on how you behave. I think the example I gave to you um, ages ago was actually about myself. And it was when I was headhunting and I used to leave um, voicemails for people. And I caught myself doing it and I had to consciously train myself out of chucking it. Um, I used to always leave a message and it was, oh, hi, it's just Vicky. You know, yeah. if you get a chance, could you call me back? So I have just played myself down three times in one sentence. Yeah. Actually, since you told me that, I have tried not to use that word now at all. Yeah, I stay away from the word just yeah. altogether. It's, it's that thing of, I know I'm good at my job, but. Yeah. Or it's yeah. yeah, you know, that, all that says to anyone who's listening to that is, well, you clearly don't believe that. And if you don't believe it, why should I believe it? Yeah. 
so it's just watching what your inner narrative is, what you say about yourself to yourself. Because quite often we are our own worst enemies. I don't even think I was aware of it until you pointed it out. Mm. Until you actually said, you know, and, you know, and emails and things like that, you know, very apologetic about everything. Yes. Um, you know, I really tried to cut out on that now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't, the problem with that is, it is a reflection of your lack of, not just yours, yeah. your lack of self-confidence. Yeah. But it bothers the person who's reading it. Yeah. They can tell there's a lack of confidence. So if you yeah. don't have confidence in you, why would they have confidence in you, especially if they're paying you to do a job? Yeah, it's true. Um, but no, I mean, I think, I think, our, was it our first coaching session and I was apologising for stuff? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm probably still guilty of it here and there, but certainly not to the extent that that I was. Um, yeah. Oh, we're all guil guilty of it, you know, here and there. But as you say, if it if it's too much of the narrative, then it just turns people off. Yeah. Um, I had a really good question here. Um, have you seen a difference in levels of the self-confidence um, due to the pandemic? Especially those that are, you know, stuck at home versus having worked in an office? That is a very interesting question. And the answer is no. Could that in, be... In my experience. Is that because we were all your clients before lockdown, so you've helped us give us the tools to manage these things? Yeah, actually, that's probably true. Well, you're probably absolutely spot on there. You, you know, a lot of you have been ongoing clients um, since before the pandemic hit. So that relationship was already established. You know, the dialogue was set at a certain level. So, no, I haven't seen any massive changes in people. No, not in that situation. I have seen a lot of changes in people's confidence and how they're dealing with things. I mean, the because as you know, I do my voluntary work. Yeah. As well. And um, I've seen the attitude of the volunteers and how they're coping change quite dramatically in this third lockdown. So um, why don't you tell us about this accidental voluntary um, project <laughs> that you've been on that was only supposed to last a few weeks ago yeah. last in March? Yes, exactly. We're coming up for our um, one year anniversary. Oh, joy. Yeah. So, yes, I accidentally found myself running a shop. But it's a different kind of shop because it's a free shop. Yeah. So kind of out of nowhere. Um, ended up with a whole load of donations that the food bank didn't want because they couldn't store them. And with the backing of my local town council, we actually ended up setting up what we call the community store. But because none of us had ever run a shop, let alone a food bank, um, we set it up as a store so that people can just literally walk around. We've got little trolleys and everything, and they walk around and they pick what they want off the shelves. Yeah, and you've kind of grown quite a lot over the last 10 <clears throat> months as well, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, I've had to dig out some, you know, going back to the thing I was saying earlier about, you know, you're not just a headline, you know, what is the extent of your skill set and how can you utilise it? So I have gone back to writing rotas, uh, training, onboarding, you know. All the things you thought you'd never do again. Exactly. You know, the joy of being self-employed is that you don't have to do these things. Yeah. Because it's admin and <laughs> best to friends. I just seen Eddie's comment. <laughs> it's much better than Amazon, I bet. <laughs> oh. Chai, this is like, wait till you hear the kind of stuff that Vicky gets in her shop. Oh, so it's, this um, is sorry for you. Yeah, we're, de we're definitely sorry in what people think that people need in a global pandemic. I mean, some of the funniest ones are obviously people just getting stuff out of their cupboards, from the back yeah. of their cupboards. So the pigeon patty, which arrived Christ. very early on. Yeah. I even, did not even know that was a thing. Thankfully, I've only had the one. So I think we can rest assured that it's not a thing. Okay. 
and was unlikely to become a thing. Um, mm. Things like fake tan. Oh wow, know? that's because yeah. that's an emergency item. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, honestly, there's just you did you did tell me about the drama. There's no couscous. Oh yeah, ran out of couscous. No oh. quinoa. We ran out of quinoa. quinoa. Oh, quinoa. They're all the same to me. Oh, exactly. But uh, oh no, we get some crazy stuff in. We really do get some crazy stuff in. Yeah. Which this is all a bit of a giggle, really. I don't even so, you probably I need that. totally object to the fact that the people of Surrey haven't cleaned their cupboards out for some of them for as long as 10 years. Yeah, that's a bit worrying that people are handing in food that old. The oldest with oldest thing we've had was 2003. It was a bottle of olive oil that had obviously been bought on holiday and someone's gone, oh, this is my favourite olive oil while I've been on holiday. So they brought it home, put it in the cupboard and never looked at it again. Oh my goodness. And then when we were looking for donations, they went, oh, I know, I'll give that to the poor people. And are you get We're COVID-19 response only. Yeah. So we're not a registered food bank, but we're, but we're COVID-19 response. So it's all self-referral. And what we were getting was the furloughed, the company directors who couldn't furlough themselves, the self-employed, you know, so really picked a up. Real mix. Yeah, really picked up that bit of the system that, can't get a referral because yeah. they don't hit a food bank's criteria. And and well, I've learned from you that it, it there's a lot of poverty out there, even in like in affluent areas around Surrey, where you would think people are fine. Yeah, but I mean things like furlough, you're losing twenty percent. But if two of you are furloughed, that's forty percent of your household income just disappeared. Yeah. And that's only on your average hours or your set hours. So if you were this, if you were in a job where you were relying on overtime, you didn't get the overtime. Yeah. In the so, and then it's and expensive then, around here. Yeah, it definitely is. I can attest to that. Um, but so they just have to like, do they have to offer proof to come into the shop, or it's just yeah. you just? Well, I mean, they phone the council. Take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're all, you, but we knew that right from the start. You have to be pragmatic about these things. People were going to take the mickey, but a few take the mickey. But, I mean, considering we're serving, what, about 120 people a week now. Yeah. Yeah. The percentage uh, oh, of taking the mick is... Yeah. You've also had the Royal Seal of Approval, haven't you? Yes, we've had the Royal Seal of Approval. So um, we had an official but private visit from Prince Edward, which was publicised. And we've had two other visits from another member of the royal family, but they are wholly private visits, so I can't talk about them. To me, that's just testament to how, how um, well you're working as a team within the shop to support the community and obviously make it a really nice environment to work in as well. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad when the royals want to come back and volunteer and muck in. So what have you learned in the last year that you has surprised you? Uh, Apart from your tolerance level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you give people the opportunity to do good things, they will take it. That's, that's good to know. You know, and I mean, one of the other things about the store and the way that we gather donations is, you know, we encourage and, um, oh God, there's a word, but I can't remember what it is right now. Damn it. What was I saying about language? <sighs> we make it easy for people to donate. So yeah. we have a main donation day, which is we call Trolley Tuesday. I love um, because, because we put trolleys around the villages yeah. around here and people can then just go, it's an easy drop off point. It's at the same place at the same time every single week and I think one of the things that actually has given the community as well is a sense of psychological safety right so um, they might not need the food bank they might not be able to volunteer in the food bank but they can help support their neighbours so yeah. that's one thing that I've really noticed around here because not many people know who that many of their neighbours are yeah. but just to see that level of care is lovely yeah. and um, we put 
We put it yeah. on a shopping list every single week and people literally go to the supermarket to buy that shopping list, which is just wonderful. Yeah, that's really lovely. Hmm. Got another question from Eddie, back to the coaching side. Um, for self-employed coaching, is it important to set goals? And oh, I like this, what is your definition of success? Read that back out again, because I think you've read it slightly differently to how ah, For the self-employed coaching, is it more important to set goals and what is your definition of success? Is it two questions? Yeah, that's a compounded question. I'm not quite sure what it means. You're not meant to ask compound questions, Eddie. You're not meant to ask compound. That just confuses issues. That's a no-no in coaching. That's a no-no. <laughs> um, setting goals is very important. Um, but being able to be agile with those goals is actually more important. And the thing is, when you're setting those goals, just be sure that they align with your values and what you really want, not what you think you should want. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. You know, and everyone's familiar with the SMART goal, but there's a thing that's sort of coming more and more prominent, which is the SMART air goal. Okay. So you've got your goals, but they've got to be exciting yeah. to be relevant. If this is, I need to trudge through this to yeah. get something that I'm not really entirely sure that I want, um, then it's not worth setting the goal in the first place. It really isn't. I mean, defining what you don't want is probably quite a bit more important than defining what you do want. Because what you don't want is what will drive you away from whatever it is, be that yeah. your job, your company, whatever the client base, you know, whatever it is. So defining what you don't want is very, very important. My definition of success is to see things like Susan flourishing. Thank you. Um, yeah, my, my definition of success is millions in the bank. It's enjoying yeah. what I do, having a nice work-life balance and being financially stable. And I'm quite happy with that. And, you know, if I could just get a date with Robbie Williams, then that would just be the icing on the cake. But you know, we can't have everything, can we? I think so. his wife. I think his wife would thoroughly object. Um, sorry, who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. So I guess there's a lot of people who are probably in a lot of dilemmas right now. Different ones, like maybe should they stay in the job that they hate but it's secure <clears throat> or you know should they try something new there's a lot of people setting their own businesses up i've noticed in the last yeah. year um or maybe it's just a change of career or a change of direction what kind of advice would you give them to start out just well, for most, most people If you are truly miserable, then are you actually living? That's part of where I come from with that. But then I'm lucky. I don't, you know, I'm not encumbered with children that I have to worry about, um, you know, their education and, you know, what their futures are going to be. So, you know, I, I can talk about it from a relatively selfish point of view. But sometimes because I've coached a few people around this actually who hated their jobs until we started talking about their jobs. And they didn't actually hate their job. Oh. What they weren't doing was asking for more empowerment from their boss. Right. What they weren't doing was feeling valued. Um, there was a whole load of things. So actually they didn't need to change job. They just needed to change how they thought about their job, their colleagues, themselves within that job. I love that. Yeah. I, I, you always do this. You always give a really different, interesting way of, of thinking about things. Yeah. If you're unhappy with something, right, and you go down the pub. The pub? What was the pub? Do you remember? Do you remember when we used to go out? Remember when we used to have coaching in the pub, you know, <laughs> fun days in the sun, yeah. You know, and you go and you talk to your mates or your spouse or your sibling or whatever, and you go and you start moaning about, you know, whatever the situation is, they'll just agree with you. Yeah. You know, they won't get you to critically think about, okay, what is it? Pick it apart. 
What don't you like? And why don't you like it? What would look better? How can you achieve that? What's holding you back from achieving that? Yeah. You know, how long can you tolerate this situation? Yeah. You know, what's your part in the situation? That's, I love that. The other thing that's always stuck with me that you had mentioned to me once, I think you'd given someone else the advice. They were, they were looking for something, but you said they were so focused on like their finger that they oh, couldn't yeah, yeah. see what was going on. Yeah. Like we're all so busy just, you know, yeah. looking at what's there that we can't see the, the bigger picture. Yeah. And that guy still does that. And I yeah. thought I'd it, but apparently I haven't. It's called <laughs> something um and it was it was just a physical demonstration of how his focus on something too close and too narrow and just said to him if you pull your finger out you'll see a bigger picture yeah maybe that's what you're missing yeah that that's always really stuck with me I've always kind of thought about that you know I'm you know am I focusing on on the wrong thing like you said about the job thing yeah you know it's maybe not the job it's it's the the the, the pieces around it yeah, yeah, absolutely. So who's your favourite client? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not yeah. Susan Walsh, I can tell you that. Don't yeah. tell her, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, I get, have you, I, I mean, I think you've told me this, but, you know, have you ever had to, like, um, finish a relationship with a, a coaching client because it just wasn't working or...? Thankfully, because I have a background in interviewing people. Yeah. Um, and I do trust my gut and I listen very, very intently to what's being said. Um, I tend just to not start those relationships. I haven't had to end one yet, but I oh, just tend to not start them. Brilliant. Because there's no point in starting something where you know you can't serve that person properly. Yeah. That's why you're my coach, because yeah. you're always thinking about the bigger picture. <laughs> so I think we should also talk about that buzzword at the moment, limiting beliefs. Oh, limiting beliefs, Let's yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's got, yeah, it's got too endemic and it's got too, got too broad to what it actually is. Um, you know, a lot of limiting beliefs are, I wouldn't say they're not real. Of course they're real, um, but it's what feeds them. You know, is it a self-confidence issue? Is it listening to the inner critic? Um, what's your evidence for this limiting belief? I love when you ask me that because I never have any evidence. <laughs> <laughs> There's but, never but, one piece of evidence. Yeah, I mean, I find that absolutely fascinating. Someone says, you know, oh, I just can't do this or I'm just rubbish at that or, you know, whatever it is that they, you know, that they feel it's impossible for them to do, but it's incredibly important for them to be doing. And I say, okay, well, what's your evidence that um, this is true? And again, it's kind of like the, the mind reading conversation yeah. from earlier. It's like, well, it just is. It's like, no, no, I require empirical evidence. You need to demonstrate to me what's going on here. Yeah. And it, just asking that question sometimes can shake people out. You know, I, and is it is it actually important? You know, is this thing pivotal in your life or your job or your career or your relationship? Or are you just distracting yourself from something else? So I'm not saying that limiting beliefs don't exist. Of course they do. But what I try to do is contextualise them. Yeah. Do you think people are making a bigger deal out of them or...? Or or, de, or or kind of devaluing what it actually is because it's banded around so yeah. openly now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess it's the same with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. As well. Look, we all have imposter syndrome. Well, yeah, I'd say pretty much everybody has imposter syndrome. But again, you know, I will sit down and I'll say, okay, so where's your evidence for not being good at X, Y, and Z? And, you know, what would, how would someone else be able to see that? Yeah. yeah. So, again, it's just going down that road of, yeah, but tell me about your achievements. You know, 
tell me about the last time you did this and how did it go and how was that received and how did you feel about it and, and all the rest of it. And sometimes it is just about, you know, letting, it's that British thing as well, isn't it? You know, it's like we were all born with a birch twig in our hands. You know, if in doubt, beat yourself up. Yeah. You know, but whatever you do, don't boast. I don't even understand what that is. Yeah. You know, I've had that conversation with you. I've had it with various clients. I'm like, yeah. okay, you know, this is a situation. And I go, oh, you know, I don't want to sound boastful. So, well, how is it boastful if it's a fact? You did this. Oh, yeah, I know, but. Yeah, yeah. I remember what? <laughs> Actually, something else that's really powerful that you do is you, you just say back something that I've said to you. Yeah. And then look at me. And when you say it, it just sounds so ridiculous. Like, sometimes yeah. you just need someone else to yeah. say it out loud in front of you. And then you're like, yeah. okay, that's the silly idea. Or no, yeah. I don't think about that. Yeah. And that, that's actually, that's a very basic but very powerful tool in coaching is to, obviously you don't do it with every sentence because then you're just a parrot, but just every so often something pops up and, you know, you can recognise over the course of the relationship or whatever, but that actually that's that's a crux point, that's a key yeah. point. And you've talked about the inner critic a few times, so where does that come from? Ah, I love transactional analysis. Because um, that's where the inner critic derives from. So, as beings, we constantly fluctuate through three um, ego states. Right. So, at the moment, we are both in adult mode. Right. But there will be times where you'll be in parent mode. Uh, but there'll also be times where you're in child mode. And you know. We, 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 we move through these depending on the situations that we're in. Yeah. Right. So ideally in um, a business conversation, especially, you know, you want to both be in adult to adult. You're having, you know, a conversation with your spouse about something. You want to be in adult to adult. But you may say something that then triggers the other person to go either into critical parent or smothering parent or petulant child or yeah. you know, there are fun there is a fun child in there as well yeah but your inner critic is a bit is often your own internal critical parent okay. and that doesn't mean to say that it's been a parent that's been critical but it's been a person in authority at some point in your earlier you know your sort of formative yeah. years yeah yeah and um yeah you beat yourself up oh i'm not worthy i'm not good enough you know I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, and we, because it's internalized, it's like your, your brain's a fantastic thing, right? But there it is sitting inside a very hard shell. And sometimes I feel that that shell actually just makes your thoughts, they're like, it's like an echo chamber. So you start yeah. thinking negative things, you've got that inner critic thing going on. And it's, it just gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Yeah definitely um more aware of that now um, yeah really fascinating have you had any questions for a while if anyone's got any questions um if anyone's thinking about coaching what would be their starting point well i think the first thing is that you have to be ready for it a decent coach it will you know, i know this is Big question, but how do you know if you're ready for it? The big thing with me is, and this is my definition, yeah. I think it sh probably should be a sort of wider definition, coaching should not be an easy process. Right? So yeah. if you know that psychologically and emotionally you're prepared to be challenged, then you're ready. If you're not ready to be challenged, then you're not ready for coaching. You won't get out of it what you need to. That's um, so that's really great advice. Um, yeah. so, so we've decided that we are ready to be challenged. What do we do next? Uh, well, we also, we speak to, I would say, a minimum of four coaches. 
um, find someone that matches your style, uh, your personality, someone that you feel comfortable with, someone that you think is going to add value to you. Um, and don't base it just on someone's qualifications, don't base it just on the cost. You know, the value is, is different than that. Yeah. You know, it is about getting that person who, as I said earlier, who will collaborate with you, not collude with you, challenge you, uh, bring you clarity and gives you the, the confidence that they're going to do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I describe myself regularly as the worst base friend you'll ever have. To me, you're that, the best friend. <laughs> but that's what I do. Yeah, not everybody likes that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, if I say brutal honesty, then that sounds a bit harsh. But you know, you are very honest, and I and I love yeah. that because I, I guess I, I grew up in a family where we're all pretty honest with each other as well. So yeah. I'm used to. I need that kind of to snap me in and out of whatever I'm in. Yeah, you also have to. You also have to feel that you're going to be in a place of safety because if you don't feel that you're going to be in a place of safety and listened to then you're not going to open up as much as you probably should. Actually, that's a really good point about the listen to because, yeah, there are some coaches that just tell you how they're going to improve your life rather than listening to what you actually need first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And their definition of your improved life isn't, wouldn't necessarily be yours. Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, the thing about really good coaches is that they are active listeners. They're not just sitting, waiting to be able to make their next pronouncement or ask their next clever question. Yeah. You know, they listen to everything. They listen to the language. They listen to the tone. They watch the body language. Yeah. I mean, I'm not just saying this. You pick up on the smallest bits, well, to me anyway, the <laughs> smallest bits of detail in something that I've said, that I've said as a throwaway comment, and you're like, wait a minute. Why did you know? What did you just say that you know? Yeah. And I'm like, what, what? What did I just say? I don't know. Um, yeah, you, really sharp on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I've and and now actually, yeah, I guess uh, so. For me, yeah, probably in the beginning, I would have been really paranoid about that. Like, oh, what have I done wrong? Oh my goodness! You yeah. know? I'm like, oh, okay, let's correct that. Um, but you know, I I've said this before um, to to other, some other people. A year ago, if you'd said to me, your business is going to grow massively, you're going to have a team, um, you know, it's going to be great, you're going to have this amazing new flat to live in, and I would have been like, oh, yeah, I've just been really lucky. Whereas now, yeah. I'm like, no, I have worked really hard for this, and, and I would never have said that before. I would have kind of, again, been kind of apologetic about, yeah. about having some success, whereas now yeah. I'm like, no. People, people do that a lot. I think it's, I don't know if it's a particularly British thing. Uh, I haven't worked with many international clients, but they give away their wins. Yeah. But again, is it, because you're actually one of the people who say to me very early on, oh, I wouldn't like to say anything like that to anyone because that's just boastful. And yeah, yeah. Looking at you. Yeah, and now yeah. I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't <laughs> care what you think. No, I'm just kidding. But well, no, I do, I do, but I don't. Like, not in a... Yeah, yeah in a rude way but yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm comfortable enough now knowing my skills and me to yeah. to be okay with saying guess what I did this yeah but you've got you also you know your value now yeah and you've stopped doing That's that huge. Yeah. yeah what was what was the thing that you used to do a lot at the beginning Susan what do you used to chase oh the sparkly things yeah oh, the sparkly, yeah <laughs> yeah, very, really distracted by that. You you kind of pulled me out of of the middle of a massive sparkly chasing scenario. Yeah, I mean, you were just chasing anything that was going, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, and taking your eye off the ball, the things that you actually needed to be doing, because they seemed more interesting. Yes, I think that's a good point. It's not always about you need coaching because because you feel broken, but it could be that you're you're going in a better direction but you're just a bit distracted and need a bit more focus yeah yeah, yeah. All, so much of it is about clarity mm -hmm. you know if you have clarity around yourself and your thinking then you have you know a better direction of travel 
rather than when I first started working with you. We'd be going down the road at one point, and then yeah, you see something, you'd be like, "Ooh, little Miss Magpie." Yeah. I'm like Susan, what, why are we going there? <laughs> what's what's yeah. the bad with that? Yeah, it was it was literally a little bit like, "Oh, someone's taken an interest in me." Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, like I question everything now. You know, like, is this right for me? Is this the right direction? Should I be doing this for the business? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's definitely made me think. I'm just having a look at some questions here. Um, Shirley says it's important to love yourself, forgive yourself, and recognize that it's okay to not be 100% perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. And Peter's just saying about LinkedIn that you there's so many great resources, you know, and there's loads of coaches on LinkedIn. So you should be able to find someone on the platform. I can see you, you're scrutinizing every single yeah, text that's, that's, there. It's, it's also, yeah, I need a new prescription in my glasses. Ah. Um, depending on chatting, sharing experiences, self-coaching and mentoring, has this had an impact on your business? Um, no because, thanks for the question, Peter, people who are serious about coaching want one-on-one -on -one coaching and they're not going to do the equivalent of going down the pub on LinkedIn. Um, you know, this is about investing time, effort and money in yourself um, because coaching is a relationship. It's not about a 20-minute chat with somebody on LinkedIn. See, I... Totally different perception there, but you're so right, actually. Um, and I was also going to say, well, you know, you have also been exceptionally busy with the shop. Well, um, yes. You were never on LinkedIn an awful lot anyway, but, um, you know, you've been doing such great things elsewhere that, but yeah, and also I guess it's quality, not quantity as well. Um, yeah, that's what I feel. And the thing about coaching and mentoring is, the coach, the mentor, or the one who's a combination of the two, like myself, um, really needs to get to know you, your drivers, and your values before they just throw advice. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Another question for you. Who did that? What have been some of the biggest challenges from a coaching perspective? Do you... I don't understand if that person means for me or for the businesses. Um, let's see, who was that? Um, I can't see who that is. I am. No, it, just said, it just said LinkedIn user. Oh, Stephen. Right. Right, Stephen. Yeah, if you want to just clarify that question. Um. <laughs> Where's Dave? <laughs> You'd be saving someone in Canada's ass with a video chat. <laughs> <laughs> Depends if you're ready. Exactly. Um, and we have a response from Stephen. It was for businesses. Right. Okay. And I guess that I guess it depends on whether it's like a corporation or a, like a self-employed small business type scenario. Um, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go back, Stephen, and, and cover off something that um, Susan and I said earlier because I just want to speak from my own experience and not just have a stab in the dark. But the businesses that I've been working with, the other than working from home hasn't really had much of an impact on their businesses. So if if someone was struggling right now with their business, what's the first mm -hmm. thing they should look at or think about? Uh, well, again, I, I don't want to give simplistic answers because it really depends what they're struggling with and why. Is it basically that their, you know, their client base has just fallen through the floor? You know, do they need to think about adapting who they appeal to? You know, there's a whole loads of, you know, the thing about COVID, we're all in it together, but it's a very different journey for pretty much everybody. Oh, it's We're all in the same boat, but it's a different size. Have you heard that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many things, you know, it, it, is the business viable? Can you hang on for long enough? Should you be trying your hand at something new? You know, should you be diversifying? Should you be taking your offering online? I mean, there's just so many questions in that one. There's just no simple answer. Yeah, and also this far down the line, potentially a bit late now. Well, if it's... I don't know. Some people, have, some people are still hanging on in there. They've only got a few months left, though. So yeah, maybe yeah. they should have started thinking about changing. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Folks, I've talked to a struggling to find a new raison d'etre, so I try to see what they're. Ah. She's our wow, and as I type this, is I hear Vicky saying precisely that. See, there you go. That good, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, we was just saying being able to offer a fresh, you know. I mean, that, and that's, that's really what you're offering. It means, we, you know, we all got stuck in our own fugs. You know, you really just need someone who's going to question, is your fug real? Okay, we're just going to have to talk about fugs for a minute. <laughs> that's well, a new one on me. Yeah, I mean, you know, fug is just that brain state where it's all just a bit fuzzy and okay. you're lost and, you, you know, yeah. you can't. You can't see properly. You can't get any clarity on it, you know. And you're just kind of lost in a bit of a sort of not necessarily a pit of despair. That's all we're doing it, but you know, you're sad. You're down. You can't self motivate. Because self motivating is pretty difficult, especially in circumstances like COVID nineteen global <laughs> pandemic. The kit is always in your head. It doesn't matter <laughs> who you are. Quite yes. often I will tell Vicky I'm in a scenario and something happens and I'll say something and I'm like, I'm channeling my inner Vicky here. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, Peter's probably not going to sleep tonight wondering what cameras and microphones I put, <laughs> put in his house in his head. Yeah, but it, it, I guess it's it's a great example of, again, how we're not all that different really. No, no. I mean, that that the male-female thing for me just doesn't really exist yeah in terms of you know what people bring to the coaching table is is what matters yeah I, you know and, and it's very similar and as i say you know once someone's willing to come to coaching once they're willing to be challenged they're prepared to be a bit vulnerable and honest and open that's when the differences are even less yeah definitely you know um, these are are you Sorry, these are people who are wanting to make fundamental changes to themselves. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Do you think Peter's so lying? The guys are having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Like you said, they're hiding their inner demons. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, dear. And poor Peter's gone for a lie down in the dark. Yeah. Like, what's she done? How did she know? Um, um, so... Yeah. If people want to get in touch with you, how? What's the best way to get in contact? Oh, you can. I mean, obviously, ping me on LinkedIn. Uh, all my contact details are on there. So if you don't want to um, link in with me, um, you should be able to see my web address, my mobile phone number is there, my email is there. Um, if you don't get me straight away, I'll get back to you. If I'm not date rotating, stalking, yeah. I'm yeah. to the door. Telling people off for putting their dates in the wrong order. Exactly. Or entertaining a member of their own family. Yeah, you know. I'm actually a princess now. Come on. Three royals. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, it's like mm, working with the royals or me, you know, what's better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Edward wasn't as much fun. I can say that. He was fun, but he's quite a shy guy. Yeah, it's come across quite shy. Yeah, yeah, quite shy. Yeah, but I guess oh, everyone. Like, oh, shy. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So, any last thoughts, tips, um, recommendations for people? I mean, I guess, you know, there is a cost involved in coaching, but is there anything that they can do as an alternative if they. I mean, don't get. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of books out there. There's stuff on YouTube. Um, just make sure that what you're reading and or listening to or watching is resonating with you for the right reasons, not because it's full of buzzwords. 
because there's something in there that just strikes you, that it gets to the heart of whatever your issue is. See? Oh, there you go. Peter's, Peter's, Peter's hadn't had to go ah. in a dark room. That's good. Yeah. Don't worry, Peter. I'm taking the cameras out later. <laughs> and actually, something else um, that you've said to me before, which I think is really important, is that you have like a, an initial kind of discovery call with everyone that's interested in your coaching because it's not a one size fits all approach that you no, have. It's literally specific to that person. Yeah. So for me, if I was watching this now and looking at coaches, I would be looking for a coach that takes that approach rather than just saying, this is what I do. Yeah. Um, get them, to, yeah, get one, get one that listens. Oh yeah, absolutely. Listening is the big thing and it's not, there is no one size fits all. And you know, I was talking about my training earlier, you know, to have that range of models, to not just have, you know, my ideas, thoughts and experience to, to bring to bear. It's that, okay, this will work with this particular person. Yeah. Right. So let's explore that model. You know, let's see how people react to it rather than just sitting there. I mean, people do say, oh, you know, I've got my program and I do this. And it's just like, at what point is your client involved in that? You know, and in week one, we'll do this. And in session two, we'll do that. And it's just like, well, steady. Yeah, I did some business coaching like that. And it just it was like, this this doesn't fit what I need. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't go, for, don't go for someone who's decided to tell you that they've devised a program um, and one size will fit all. Yeah. And just in the last couple of minutes, any good recruitment stories, like bad candidates or bad clients? Oh. Apart from like 12 rounds of interviews, which is absolutely ridiculous. Oh, yeah, I've had the, I've had the 12 rounds of interviews. Um I had the person who was going for uh, a head of chemistry um, and I looked at the CV and I thought, that looks a bit odd. It's got a PhD, but there's no title to the PhD. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I researched it a bit deeper. Turned out he bought his degree. He was actually working at quite a senior level, but only had an under, it was quite entertaining. Uh, and then I had one of my like absolute belters was a French chap who decided to tell us that he spoke fluent German because the office that he was, it was a multinational company yeah. and the office he was going to be attached to was in Germany. So he had done this sum in his head that he had to be able to speak German. It wasn't actually a requirement, by the way. Yeah. The Germans, anyway, they both spoke English, so it was all going to okay. be fine. And um, yeah, didn't speak German, not a word. So, you know, a lot of head hunting is all about networking. So I phoned one of his ex colleagues and said, Does this guy speak fluent German? And he went, No, not a word. <laughs> so we, phoned, we got hold of him and said, uh, You'll be conducting your first interview with the German office over the phone in German. It was uh, in face that he didn't speak a word of German. <laughs> Absolute madness. I've, I think that, I mean, I wasn't in recruitment very long. I did about three months, but. Um, there was just one thing that stuck out for me. This was like, this company did executive search and like high level stuff and sales account managers and things like that. And um, this CV came in and it was literally like one sentence. That was it, like a whole bit of A4 was just like blank with this one sentence. And I was working down here in Guildford, but didn't the woman just have to be from Dundee? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, and then, yeah, I was like, and this was like 2003. So, you know, people knew about having a good CV back then. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, mental. Mental. Yeah. Oh, dear. Anyway, darling, our, our hour is up. That is it. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, um, thank I you for having me. That, um, we've had some good questions, and so I hope that has brought some uh, information and some lighthearted entertainment to everyone in the last hour. Exactly. Um, that's Thank the other you. thing. Coaching shouldn't be too serious. You are allowed to laugh in coaching. It's not for all coaches. Oh, yeah, no, we, we laugh a lot. <laughs> it's part of the fun. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks so much. I will pop you backstage. Okay, cheers. So that's it for another hour. Again, I am completely disorganized and can't remember who I have on next week. So I'm just going to pull that up now for you.
um, because that is the chaos that is my life right now. Um, and next week, we have Sam Knowles, who is going to talk about data. So it's our data week again. So if you have any questions, um, give me a shout. I hope you have a great week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. And yeah, if you've got any suggestions about who you would like to see in the data den, give me a shout. Thanks a lot.